Hello, this is Pat Lynch, and this is the Career Pathways Podcast. Normally, you'd find us in the luxurious basement of the Lion Library at our Kilt Radio International Studio, but today we are doing a, a remote broadcast over at Dream and Stream. Kelly, say hello. Hello. And I highly recommend if you want a professional podcast like this one uh, done, give Kelly a shout. Uh, today, our guest is Skip Rutherford. Uh, he's just a, a, a Arkansas legend. Uh, he's going to talk about everything from his work uh, with Bill Clinton in building a library, helping with his presidential campaign, to his career in public service. We think you're going to really enjoy this podcast. And of course, always joining me will be producer Jason and, as always, Gavin. Bronson, yes. All right, so uh, stay tuned, and we'll talk. We'll talk with you in a moment. Thanks. Hello, this is Pat Lynch, and you're listening to the Career Pathways podcast. Today, we're going to be joined by Skip Rutherford, and I'll let Skip introduce himself in just a moment. I'm also joined by our crack podcasting team. Guys, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Gavin Brunson. And I'm Jason Nichols. And Skip, welcome. Uh, Pat, thank you for having me. Uh, Gavin, Jason, good to be with you. Uh, I appreciate uh, this opportunity. Uh, Pat, I uh, first of all want to thank you for the great work you're doing at Lyon College and promoting opportunities for students. I think uh, that's uh, one of the things that, that – uh, I've noticed that higher education has been lacking, not all campuses, but the fact that you are an advocate for students and an advocate career has is, is, is certainly gotten my attention, both uh, as a Batesville native and as a uh, Lyon College board member. I grew up in Batesville uh, within walking distance of the uh, Lyon College campus. Uh, my uh, my dad and my uncle both graduated uh, from Lyon College, uh, my dad uh, played baseball there. The uh, the press box uh, and the baseball field is 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 named in his memory. Uh, so we've had a long connection with the campus, and it's an honor to serve on the on the board of trustees. I graduated from Batesville High School. Pat went on to the University of Arkansas, uh, started a career uh, in communications and public relations always had an interest in politics and public service. From there, uh, spent uh, uh, a lot of time in the private sector, joined the staff of Senator David Pryor, uh, later went to work back in the private sector with uh, the, uh, the CEO of Arc La Gas, Matt McClarty, who became President Clinton's White House Chief of Staff. Uh, and... Uh, Worked there, went back to the private sector uh, with a Cranford Johnson, the communications firm. Spent about 10 years there before becoming dean of the, of the Clinton School of Public Service. I served there for 15 years uh, and retired in uh, 2021. Uh, now I'm uh, doing things I like to do that I don't have to do but enjoy doing. I am working as much as I can to help Lyon uh, on the new proposed dental and vet schools. And I'm excited about the growth that I've seen in the undergraduate enrollment and the emergence of some really talented new faculty on the Lyon staff. Outstanding. The, you know, so you started out as a, uh, in communications. That was your uh, degree, and uh, you were a PR kind of guy. What, what was that like? Well, I, I, that's a career I've, I mean, it, 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 first of all, it was most enjoyable. I edited the student newspaper at the University of Arkansas uh, and was very involved in that. And I combined that journalism, communications, public relations, politics, and got really involved in campus stuff and then uh, statewide elections uh, and started following, I started following politics all my life and when I was in Batesville. Growing up, I was always involved in, in uh, political campaigns, helping friends who were running for sheriff or county judge mm -hmm. or whatever. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was certainly out handing cards and doing all that. 
But the communications aspect was, uh, and the PR aspect was something that I was always interested in. Uh, and I've been able to use those skills uh, throughout my whole career. And so you, in the political sense, was it your work for Senator Pryor where you started to get that experience in terms of political messaging? Well, it, it, I, I, from, a, from a personal perspective, uh, I'd been studying political messaging for a long time, but I had some great professors both uh, in journalism and in other areas at the University of Arkansas, but I also uh, really fine-tuned it uh, working for uh, Senator David Pryor and then um, later fine-tuned it when I um, helped Bill Clinton in his 92 a successful presidential run. But well, we got to jump into that, <laughs> you know, because you know everybody sees sees it on you know in film, and they read about it, you know. They and what was it really like being in a presidential campaign like that? Because you know he's it wasn't that he was a sure you know he who is this guy? He comes from one of the smaller states in the country, you know. He's you know and he's had a great speech. You know, at, one, at a prior convention, you know, got got people's attention. But then, yeah. boom, here he is on the on the national scene. Well, it it, it was uh, pretty surreal that I remember uh, one day I was walking in my uh, in my neighborhood, and I was out walking in a and I just kind of went on a morning walk, and just and a friend of mine drove up and said, uh, "Governor Clinton is." is is looking for you. And I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll call him. I'll call what, when I get home. He said, no, you got to get in the car right now. And I said, what do you mean get in the car right now? I'm, I'm, I stink. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm out, you know, I'm out. So we, we only have an hour. We got to go. And I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to the governor's mansion. I said, you have got to be kidding me. I said, number one, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to, to even be looking like this in, uh, Everybody else was nice dressed. Here I, you know, I looked terrible. And, um, but we went to the governor's mansion and there were three or four of us there. And I remember him saying, I'm thinking about running for president. First time I've, and I thought, so we asked everybody, what do you think? My brilliant political skills, Gavin. I said, well, I don't think you have a chance. <laughs> I mean, why? How, how can a governor from a small landlocked state compete on a national level? Uh, number one, I don't think you can win the Democratic nomination. And then number two, how, how are you going to beat George Bush in yeah. the general election? The incumbent. I said, I, I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I, I mean, I, are, are, I said, now, unless you're doing this to get your name recognition out for four years from now, but... Gosh, politically, I just don't see how it works. And he said, well, I appreciate your opinion. And I came home, and I, I remember getting home. They brought me back. My wife thought I'd died on the street somewhere because I... <laughs> Disappeared. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> he had a heart attack and laid out on the street. And I walked in, and she said, where have you been? And I said, well, uh, I, I've been at the governor's mansion. And she said, you have got to be kidding me, looking like that. And I said... Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. And she said, but you went? And I said, yeah. She said, what was so important for you to be the governor's mansion? I said, well, I think he's going to run for president of the United States. And she said, and what did you tell him? I said, I told him he didn't have a chance. And she said, and what did he say? He said, he thanked me for my opinion. And she said, what do you think? And I said, He's going to run. And if he does, our lives will never be the same. Yeah. How do you – Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to ask <clears throat> when – okay, so he, he becomes the president, right? How do you think that changed the political, like, world of the United States, like politics? Like this, you know, from a small state, he comes and wins it and becomes president. How do you think – did do you think that, like, sparked a hope for, like, other – People in like like let's say like South Dakota and all these other places that feel kind of underrepresented like underrepresentative in the United States. You know, it's interesting. That's that's a good question. I, I uh, one of the things about the the historical aspect of the Clinton presidency 
is in much the same way of the historical aspect of the Dwight David Eisenhower uh, presidency. Dwight Eisenhower succeeded Roosevelt and Truman. There had been like 20 years of Democratic dominance or 18 years of Democratic dominance. So there wasn't a Republican farm team. So Eisenhower, when he was elected as a Republican, had to put a whole organization together, uh, not from experienced people because nobody had been in the White House. When Clinton ran, he, um, there had been 12 years of Reagan and Bush. There was not a farm team. And one of the major contributions of Dwight Eisenhower and one of the major contributions of Bill Clinton to their respective party politics and to politics in general was that they both created farm teams. And you look people, I mean, you look at people right now uh, in, the, in the Biden administration and the Eisenhower people were all uh, full of Reagan and Bush. I mean, there were a bunch of Eisenhower people. But you look at the Clinton legacy, and you've got the ambassador to Japan, uh, Rahm Emanuel, the new ambassador to Israel, Ambassador Liu from, from the Clinton world. You've got a whole bunch of people that got their starts under Clinton. So the, their pol- I think their greatest political, uh, whether you're Republican Eisenhower or Democrat Clinton, was you built a farm team. That's amazing. You know, the one one thing with the stories I've heard is, is that Bill Clinton just had, you know, that like something special. It was like that when he would meet you, you were like the only person in the room and he just had this way of connecting with people. You know, they call it retail politics, but I think it's just something inherent in him as an individual and uh, I mean, did that strike you? And you know, I guess you you're getting pulled off the street, you know, all sweaty, and here you are meeting him. And I'm sure, he, you know, he's, you know, it's like I can I can only imagine with Bill Clinton when he turns it on, what that must have been like. Clinton had the extraordinary, and still does, has the extra- remembering names. I'm not good yeah. at remembering names. I I I I, I, I try. Gavin, I try, but I'm not very good, and I know I'm not very good at. Clinton can meet you, and he is—he's just got a, a mind that remembers names. I wish I had yeah. half of that ability. Um, so his retail politics skills, Pat, were his ability to connect with people and walk into a room and call people by their names. I learned a lot by watching him. He would go to events, and I've I've tried to emulate this, not because I'm running for office, I'm not, but I've tried to emulate this in that he would go into a restaurant or to a banquet and would obviously shake hands with people. And after it was over, he'd go back to the kitchen and talk to the staff time and time and time again. He never forgot the little people. Uh, And I think that's... I think that's a real strength in politics that he that he just didn't forget the little people. You could disagree with his political views. You could uh, argue wrong on the issue uh, uh, and right on that issue, but but his political skills were really extraordinary. So you're now you, you know flash forward. You're in the presidential campaign, right? And how how did I mean that it you know it's you know, I, I, we've all read about it. You know, you had your controversies. You know, you had a lot of you know, them. Yeah, and <laughs> and and so it was like, you know, as a communication person, you know, you're getting, you're tested all the time in terms of how do you manage. You know, what do you do for messaging around this crisis, that crisis? Uh, can you tell us about that? One of the things that the Clinton organization did, Pat, was that and this was really Hillary Clinton's uh, advice, was they set up a thing called the War Room. Now we hear war rooms constantly, and I've even advocated groups to set up war rooms. But it was a messaging strategy of having um, the scheduling, the communications, the political people all in one room. 
so you could have ready response and quick response. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's, what, what, that's the way politics was changed uh, by, by that ready, rapid response. Now, it's hard uh, for you guys to that, that um, there's no Internet. I mean, there, you know, there was not a 24-hour news cycle. Once the, once the 10 o'clock news went off, it was off. Uh, so things have changed a great deal. People ask me all the time, do you think Clinton could have survived all the scandals in a Twitter world? And I would say my first reaction would be that would be very difficult. My second reaction would be he would have adjusted to the communications that would have been necessary to do it. Uh, just like he did in 1992. Um, but every campaign is different. Every one is different. Every style is different. Uh, and so what we're seeing now as we look to 2024, um, new technologies, new responses. Um, you know, in, in 1992, you know, a person having an affair almost um, – you know, lost him the, the the nomination. Now in 2023, some person can be indicted and gains in the polls. I mean, we're just in a different... Um, a whole new world. Yeah, a whole, di- whole new world. Yeah, that's a... Uh, you know, with the Clinton... Uh, he Now Bill Clinton's elected president, and you did not, like many, follow him into the White House. Why? Well, I, I, was, I was going to. I... Uh, I was going to go to work uh, in the chief of staff's office with, with Matt McClarty, and in fact, had already accepted the offer. Um, and um, you know, I was, my, my, I was. Nobody in my family wanted to go but me, so it was a four to one vote. Three kids and a wife saying, "We don't want to do this." Um, so that was a big factor. Secondly, my mother was had been diagnosed with lung cancer. She lived in Batesville. Um, and I was an only child, and I thought, yeah, you know, wait a minute, buddy. You know, wh- where are your priorities? And um, so at the very last minute, I, I decided not to go. Yeah. Any regrets? No, I'm not any regrets. The first, first year was a little regretful because I saw all these people having fun and all this stuff, and I was looking at it from afar thinking, I'm doing PR work, you know, cutting ribbons for branch banks, and they're going to yeah. sit and having cocktails on the Truman balcony at the White House. Yeah. <laughs> there was a little bit of difference there, but uh, it, that didn't last very long because I've, Clinton asked me to head up uh, his presidential library and in, in, in the Clinton School Project. Mm-hmm. So I got engulfed in that and uh, became, that, that, that took a lot of my, well, a whole bunch of my attention. Looking back at it now, does it like, I know you kind of said it, you described it as like surreal, but do you still like kind of just look back at it and it almost just feels like, man, I can't believe I did that. Like I, like it almost is like you're looking at like, am I that person? Like kind of like out of body in a way? Well, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things you realize in, in, uh, is that uh, very few of us in life have the opportunity to have a friend elected president of the United States. And I had a friend who was a friend of President George W. Bush's. And I said, get ready for this experience because it's really different. You know, you it's different to say, I know the president. I, I, I support him or her because of their political views. But when, when it's a friend, um, then all, it, it, it does make it uh, really special. So looking back, is there anything that you would change? Like anything that you go back and be like, uh, I could have did this better or uh, I should have did this? You mean in terms of the Clinton campaign or just life in general? Just life in general. Uh, you know, Gavin, I, there's probably a lot of things I would, I, I would, um, I would change. Um, I, um, I think sometimes I didn't, I was a young man in a hurry, like they describe Clinton sometimes. I think sometimes I didn't stop to smell the roses. I think 
uh, I didn't, um, I didn't, uh, I didn't wait for the flowers to bloom. I was already planting some more flowers. I think sometimes, I think as I look back, I probably should have taken a little more time to do some things. But overall, career-wise, every career move I've made and everything I've done, including being dean of the Clinton School, has been uh, just an extraordinary opportunity. I, someone said to me, well, you, you moved around. And I said, yeah, you move around if, if you have an opportunity and if you're happy. Um, I had a lot of friends that stayed in uh, long-term, high-paying jobs that ended up not being happy. I, I've never not, I mean, I've, I've always been happy. I've, I've, I've been fortunate to say that, 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 I've, that I've been happy. What, uh, we've talked about Bill, but what about Hillary? You know, because I imagine you got to know Hillary Clinton, and, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, she she had a shot at presidency. I can't remember how that turned out, but uh, uh, but yeah, what, what was she uh, as a as a person? I, it seemed like very different style than Bill's, and uh, yeah, just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, she she. Uh, a lot of people think uh, Hillary is distant and not as uh, doesn't have the retail politics skills that Bill Clinton has and her style is certainly different but um, when you get to know her in a personal basis she's incredibly not only she's smart she's very smart Uh, she is incredibly um, funny she has a real sense of humor. I remember a story she told me one time, and I've always tried to do this, um, particularly uh, when when I'm in my work at Lyon. When she was teaching at the University of Arkansas Law School, she told me, she said, you know, Skip, the students that we have here in class are every bit as bright as many of the students that I was in school with at Yale. And I'm seeing some really talented, incredible students from Arkansas and going to school in Arkansas. She said the difference is between this and Yale is that, number one, many of these students have never had, good work to you, Pat, here, have never had the professional connectional opportunities that the kids at Yale had. And number two, they really don't know how good they are. And I've always said that's a lesson that I needed to remember as dean in the classroom and as a visiting professor is that that many of these students have never had the opportunities, the outreach um, that some of the more advantaged students have had on other major college campuses. And so I, I've tried to always follow her advice on that. I think she was absolutely right. So you get a call, and it's, Skip, let's build a presidential library. <laughs> and um, so you, there, right now that's just, there's nothing there. So uh, you... You were there right from day one, you know, pre digging, the, you know, digging a hole and plant and uh, building. What was that all like? Well, I said yes when the president calls. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to say no, and yeah. I said yes. And then I hung up the phone. And I thought, what is a presidential library? <laughs> uh, now remember, guys, we were still in the early stages of. There wasn't a lot of Google, and there wasn't a lot. So I was going to the library, getting as many books as I could mm-hmm. read about presidential libraries and looking up things and so forth. Um, you know, it was a major challenge. And when Clinton went, when, when, when Bill Clinton chose the site, which is now east of I-30, where the Clinton Library and Clinton School are now, I walked down there that day by myself. And it was an old vacant warehouse district. And it was just, you know, ugly and terrible. And, and, uh, and I thought we're going to do, we're going to fix this. And I, I I stood there, 
and I thought, okay, what what do I do first by myself? I said, there, what what do I do first? Trash everywhere. I thought, well, maybe I ought to go get some trash bags and start picking up trash. And I thought I'd be picking up trash for twenty years if I did it that <laughs> way. Um, and then I uh, I sort of walked around, and I kept hearing this noise, and I didn't know where it was coming from. It sounded like it, it was, I thought maybe it was fish jumping in the river. <clears throat> and I looked up, and there was a homeless guy on the on the on the on the vac- on the abandoned bridge in the little uh, area up there. That's where he lived. I didn't know it at the time, but I quickly discovered it. And he was throwing rocks at me, uh, trying to, I was invading his territory. Uh, Luckily, he couldn't come close to hitting me because he was a long way off. But uh, I realized then, I thought, this is going to be a challenge. And uh, and it was. But it it became... You know, such an important part of Little Rock, and obviously an important part of the Clinton legacy. You know, in terms of we now today we see it and it's spectacular. But uh, you know, all the work that must have gone into making that happen. Well, 165 million dollars can transform a lot of things, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's what we raised to to build it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was complicated. There were lawsuits. There were environmental issues. There were political issues. Uh, there were there was all sorts of problems. It's, we started working on it in 1997, and we opened it in 2004. So it was a long time coming. And so then, uh, so now you got okay. Thanks, Skip. You built me a presidential library. Then then what was next? Well, after the presidential libraries, well, I was getting ready to go back to the private sector. And to be honest with you, Pat, I thought, oh, yeah. maybe for the first time in my life, I'll make some money. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, Dr. Alan Sugg, the president of the University of Arkansas, called and wanted me to come out to his office. And uh, and and I did. I went out to see him, sat in his office, and he said, "How'd you like to be dean of the Clinton School?" And I said. Dr. Sugg, with the highest respect, I, I've never been dean of a school before, and he, I said, I, I, I don't, I don't know about that, and he said, uh, Well, I need you to build me a school, and I said, Well, how do I build you a school when I don't even know what a dean does? <laughs> and he said, Well, you built a good presidential library. Did you know what you were doing then? And I thought back to going back to the library trying to figure out what it was. And I said, well, not really. He said, well, go do the same thing for me. And uh, I tried. Yeah. Then, so the, so what it, would the, uh, the school of public service, what was, what was its mission? What were you out to accomplish? Where, what kind of career paths did the uh, students who graduated, where, where did they go? Yeah, it, you know, a school of public, it's different. It's the first school of public service in the country. So you were starting from scratch. You were trying to explain to people what it was. Um, and uh, the major difference between that and its close relation to public affairs, public administration, public policy, was that a significant portion of the Clinton School curriculum, for credit, is direct field service work over the course of two years, students did three major projects, team-based, international, and individual, all for academic credit. So our students were all over the world doing projects. As I said, we pioneered remote work before the pandemic because students were working remotely on their projects uh, from the moment they started uh, uh, the school. Uh, And the career fields, it was hard. Yeah, that was a challenge, Pat, because no one had said, why would I hire a master of public service? Yeah. And so we had to work real hard. I spent the first two or three years of my deanship really working with employers, which I appreciate the work you're doing, trying to place students to say, let me tell you about this student. Let me tell you about her or his undergraduate work. Let me tell you about her or his project work. And when people looked at their resumes and they looked at their record, they realized, oh, these are incredible people. So uh, they work in all aspects, private, governmental, nonprofit, 
so there's no direct career p- path, but there are a lot of career options, and we've had a really good placement rate. Yeah, did did any of that uh, was any of that tying into the Clinton Global Initiative? Our students volunteered at the Clinton Global Initiative. Yeah. We, we've had students over the years that would go volunteer at it uh, and uh, participate, but a lot of the students uh, would. Uh, I mean, it, it depends on, you know, what they were interested in. Uh, like we had a student, um, I'll give you one example. Uh, I was reading the Chronicle of Higher Education, and there was, a, there was a student on the front page of that Chronicle named Demas Espinola. Demas Espinola was a senior at the College of the Holy Cross, a uh, very good a Catholic school, and and he was talking about student loan debt, and that he couldn't, he didn't know what he was going to do or go to graduate school. So I called the College of the Holy Cross, and said, "Can I talk to Demas Espinola?" And the college said, "Well, we can't give out his number." And I said, "Well, can you give my number and, and ask him to call? He, he won't know who I am, but." If, so a few hours later, I get this call and says, this is <coughs> Demas Espinola. Why are you calling me? And I said, well, let me talk to you about a program that looks like it might be a fit for you. Demas Espinola came to the Clinton School, compiled this extraordinary record, was accepted to the University of Massachusetts Medical School, joined the Army, fellowships, worked at Walter Reed, uh, now is uh, all sorts of doctors besides all sorts of letters besides his name and specialists uh, 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 in in San Antonio. So here was a public service guy who ended up in med school. A lot of public service people ended up in law school. A lot of people ended up in higher education. Everyone has his or her own career route which I think goes back Mm -hmm. to one of my big things about careers is you got to work with the individual student and figure out what works best (laughs) for her or him. Can you pause it? Uh, Yeah, I mean, we'll (coughs) Yeah, I got to get, do you have, get water? (coughs) Yeah, sorry about that, Skip. No, that's okay. Yeah. (coughs) Any of you guys want one? No, I'll be fine. Mm. I'm the only one coughing up a lung. Uh, I get it. Ah, all right. Thanks. Mm-hmm. You guys are about 33 minutes in. By the way. All right, we're, we're 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 going good. We're going good. We try to hit for like 45, 50. So we're <coughs> perfect. We still got some <coughs> questions left. All right. And you guys can pick back up anytime. All right. Well, all right. Uh, Another career career question as far as uh, students who want to do good in the world and go into public service, is that what, what advice would you give them? Because we, you know, I interact with line students all the time and they're, they're want, I want to work at, at the State Department or I want to, you know, just find something that's, that's kind of meaningful in life. What, what advice would you give them, Skip? Well, I would start, I would say that um, you start thinking about that no later than their sophomore year so that they can start developing contacts, internships, research. Uh, They need to connect with an alumni base who is doing some of that work and figuring out how to do that. There are lion people all over the country uh, that have done stuff that would be more than happy uh, to reach out to individual students if individual students reach out to them. If I have a criticism of Lion, and it's not, it's based on a criticism of love, not of, of, of meanness, it's that, I, I, and you're doing a great job, but I, I, I think professors need to be more engaged with their students and really start pushing them and promoting them early on. And, and, and I think that 
It needs to be connected with a an alumni base. There ought to be, and there there may be. You probably done it, Pat, because you as good as anybody in the business. But th- there ought to be like if someone says I'm interested in, um, you know, the Foreign Service, there ought to be a database of 20 aligned alums that are connected to the Foreign Service, or I'm interested in politics, or I'm interested in med school. And there ought to be a database that's just easily acceptable, uh, accessible uh, for Lion students to be able uh, to go to. And uh, and I think in the past, sometimes people leave an undergraduate uh, four years without having that resource. Part of it is students don't know how to ask or what to ask because they're trying to they're they're having a fun time in college, and I understand that. College ought to be fun. It ought to be a great experience. You ought to play basketball. You ought to do stuff. I mean, it's fun. But professors need to be looking at that student and saying, okay, what's Gavin going to do when he graduates? Probably not play professional basketball. What's he going to do when he graduates? And start opening those kinds of opportunities. So I, I don't know whether there's a great database of whatever the field is, but uh, that's what I would do. Do you think colleges should start pushing for people to s- start getting like into their major like really early on, like in their freshman year? Or no. do you think you think they should kind of still have it the same way they do now, where it's like kind of more sophomore based? I, I don't think you I, I think people you don't know your major. I think you got to feel your way through it. What I think colleges, and, and by the way, the faculty at line will probably disagree with me on this <laughs> immensely. Uh, so this is not board policy. This is skip talking. Uh, I always advise students, regardless of their majors or their career, to follow the talented faculty. So if, if let's just use the, the legendary Terrell Tebbets, who is a walking <laughs> monument. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Let's just say that if you want to learn how to write, if you want to go to law school and you want to learn how to write, you ought to take a Terrell Tibbetts course. Not that you haven't maybe not want to major in English or not that you want to certainly take that god-awful Faulkner course that he teaches. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I think to learn how to write is a really important skill. And I'm not sure that the way the curriculum is structured, that it would give you the opportunity to take writing under Terrell Tebbets, to take Arkansas history under Karen O'Keefe. I, I, I'm just not sure that there's enough flexibility. When I was teaching up there on the 2022 elections, that people said, well, you know, we're running this through the political science department. And I said, why? Can a kid in English or playing basketball interested in the Politics and elections, you have to be a political science major to w- w- want to know about what's happening in your country. I mean, you know, I mean, let's open this up to everybody. And then they said, well, this is an upper level course. I said, are you kidding me? This is an elections course. Well, 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 there's no prerequisite for this. Well, well, well can we let a, fresh, I mean, let a freshman in? Well, I don't know whether a freshman can handle it. I said, I'm the professor. A freshman can handle it. You know, so so. so Higher education sometimes, I think, is its worst enemy. So back to your question, do I declare? No, I fact, I'd postpone majors as long as I could. I like that. All right. Let's talk politics. Okay. <laughs> All right. But first is that, you know, you, your political career here in Arkansas, David Pryor, Bill Clinton, that, yeah, that was Arkansas as a, as a Democrat state versus what it is today kind of what's your assessment as far as what happened that changed the state from what it what it was when you first got involved versus where it is today well yeah yeah but the uh the thing i want to point out on that and this is really an interesting topic um there is a talented young professor who has just been named the executive director of the Pryor Center for Oil and Visual Archives at the recording. His name's John Davis. He came to Fayetteville from the University of Arkansas at Monticello. 
he has written he has written a book. It will be the definitive volume, at least currently, why Arkansas turned from blue to red. And that book is going to be published in February. You ought to bring him to campus. Absolutely. Uh, he ought to, he ought to, he ought to, he is. At, and the reason, let me tell you the other connection. Not only is John Davis a talented guy, uh, and, uh, and I, 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 he is going to be the expert on this subject. I will, he is going to be the expert because he's the first to really delve into it. Um, but the interesting thing about John Davis and why he ought to come to Batesville is that his grandfather, John Davis, was Independence County Sheriff for a long time. There you go. Mm-hmm. And as a kid, I uh, campaigned for him. Yeah. Um, so um, I'll defer that answer uh, because I want to read John Davis's book. I was interviewed for his book. I've gave you my thoughts on that. I think there are a whole bunch of factors, um, and uh, one one of which, quite frankly, is that that it, that this has been coming for a long time. Arkansas was the last of the big southern states to sh- switch. Part of that, I believe, would have happened earlier, predating you guys. But in 1990, when Bill Clinton was running for governor. There was a guy running against him named Tommy Robinson, who was a congressman, uh, who was Donald Trump before Donald Trump. <laughs> and Tommy Robinson, had he won that race, Arkansas would have shifted earlier. Uh, can, so, like, talking about, like, <clears throat> like, the political divide we have in America today, would you, I want, like, your opinion, like, how do you think we should bridge that gap to, like, so we, kind of right now, like, some people argue, like, the two parties are as far away from each other as they can possibly be right now. How would you say we should start and possibly even like in the future, like how would we bridge that gap to bring people back to being, because like 60% of the United States voters are like usually in the middle. They they vote, you know, depending, they side on one side just barely. So like how would you get people back to that like in politics? Well, the middle has shrunk. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, the mod, middle and moderates have shrunk. What we have now is a strong voice on the right and a strong voice on the left, but the middle and the moderates have shrunk. Unfortunately, where we are in this country is, and and to some degree we're seeing in this state, um, is that people cannot have uh, civil dialogue anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, people cannot, uh, and I've always, I always <laughs> said in my class, I always say, everyone is entitled to her or his opinion. And I respect that and I want that. But we're also going to be respectful of other people's opinions. And because if someone disagrees with you or someone speaks something that is offensive to you, you need to understand that they um, have the right to have their own views. So we've lost our ability um, to be civil to one another. Corresponding with that, it, we're seeing, you know, if you just look, if you look at, if you just look what is happening in the Middle East right now, you know, you're seeing. Uh, you're seeing this anti-Semitic uh, happening on, on college campuses, that, but you're also seeing people reacting as, as, as innocent victims in Palestine are being slaughtered and killed and uh, bombed. And it's hard for America to understand that Hamas is not everyday ordinary people these are these are a terrorist organization that have captured a group of innocent people uh, and are putting tunnels and vortices under under their hospitals and so we've got a very divided thing right now that you're either you know Israel 
do you sympathize? I mean, yes, you sympathize. They were attacked. You see, we've all. But on the other hand, innocent people living in a country that have no, they're basically under a dictatorship that are getting bombed, do you sympathize with them? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you do sympathize with innocent people getting bombed. But, but where we are right now is so divisive that you can't say, I sympathize with, oh, I said that to somebody. Somebody said, well, how do you justify what happened to Israel? I said, I don't. I think it's horrible. I think what, I think coming in and attacking and something that we hadn't seen since the Holocaust. But at the same time, do you think uh, the, the little boy in Chicago who was, who was murdered by, because of his uh, Muslim beliefs. I don't believe that either. Do you see us like, <clears throat> if things continue to be so divided and they just, they're not getting any closer. In fact, they're probably getting farther and farther away. Do you ever see a point where, you know, when you stretch it so far, it just breaks? Do you ever see our system kind of falling in <clears throat> well, on itself? and? Collapsing? I think our democracy is under challenge, under siege <clears throat> more than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think you're, you're seeing, um, you're, you're, you're seeing groups being targeted um, and people being targeted uh, and the rule of law being challenged. Um, we've always been, you know, I, I, I really do believe it. I don't, I don't want to get into partisan politics, but I think January 6th was a big wake-up call. I, I don't care whether you're a, a Democrat or Republican. To sit there and watch your United States Capitol under siege, to sit there and watch people saying, hang Mike Pence, uh, I don't care what political party you're in. To me, I thought, my God, this is America. Th th you know, th yeah, this is. And then I also have to say that, that, uh, you know, I, I, what we're seeing where um, people want to erase black history. Yeah. I mean, really, uh, that, 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 happens, that happens in countries where you, are, you don't have a democracy. How, how do you erase black history? First of all, it was a race for a long time because people wouldn't report it or wouldn't talk about it. And you had lynchings and mobs. And we saw it in Little Rock Central High School. We saw it at Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, I mean, you can go on and on and on. I, 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 I find that troubling. I find that very, very troubling. I, um, I would, um, I, 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 so I, what I think has to happen is that I think I think we're going to have to vote for democracy. Well, speaking you, of the – well, go ahead, Gavin. I was, I was going to say, do you believe that the way mass media is and technology is now that uh, that plays a big role in shrinking that middle, or do you think it helps both sides? I think when you turn on the television, Gavin, and you see Fox News on one side and MSNBC on the other side and people – going to their respective tribes to watch and get their news. I think that's been a big play in that. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the vote, all right? So we're uh, basically a year away from uh, the next presidential election. Kind of, what's your assessment? I really do believe that 2024 is going to be a lot like 2020 and 2016. I think you're right about being more divisive and being more vocal about being divisive. But I think when it comes down to the presidential election, it's still going to come down to about six states. It's going to come down to Wisconsin and Michigan. It's going to come down to Pennsylvania and Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, going to come down to those states. Arkansas is going to go Republican. California is going to go Democrat. Mississippi is going to go Republican. New York is going to go Democrat. Texas is going to go Republican. Illinois is going to go Democrat. But there are about six states that have gone, 
right there on the edge. Do you think? Do you think there's going to be like any like um, surprising shock states that kind of like flip like maybe Florida because Florida goes back and forth all the time. Do you think like a state like Florida could possibly decide it with how many votes it has? Yeah, it could, but right now I don't see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could. I think there are several that could. Florida could. Virginia could. North Carolina could. Uh, but I don't. I don't see it right now. Do you think Florida would go Republican or Democrat in this next election? Uh, Republican. You think so, Republican? The, uh, yeah, I think Florida goes Republican. Yeah, it hasn't been a swing state. In yeah. Like three cycles. Oh. Yeah, it's been, it just keeps getting more red. But I think it's good. I think this election, as as much as as much as we want to talk about how polarizing it is, and you're right, I think it's more. Po more polarized right now than it was four years ago. I still think it's still going to narrow down to the same states. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's going to be like, and so we're, we're getting to the point in the United States where things keep getting like more and more like people are getting so vocal to the point where they're going and causing chaos like the January 6th. Do you think we're going to get another big incident like that after the election? Like if like, let's say the Democrats win or the Republicans win, do you think there will be some sort of massive outcry? You know, like, like I, that? I don't know. Uh, I think a lot uh, will depend on the circumstances, the closeness. I think the real challenge uh, that we have in 2024 is um, has all this negativity turned people off from voting? Uh, I think that's one. I think that's the the the, the challenge. I. Uh, 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 that that's what worries me more right now. Oh goodness! Well, let's get to a positive. Okay. <laughs> well, I know there's a positive. You vote for democracy. That's what right. you all <clears throat> people say. Well, what does that mean? <clears throat> I said, look, it's not partisan. Just look at the candidates that that, that are that are that are pro democracy, uh, and uh, it could be a Democrat, it could be a Republican. That's how I'm going to vote because if we lose a democracy. If we lose this where the, where the rule of law, where people, you know, I mean, literally, I sat there and watched those guys saying, hang Mike Pence because he validated an election. Right. Y'all, this is, this is the land of the free here. Are you, uh, for education, are you going to be back uh, teaching? Do you have any uh, plans as far as teaching in the, in the upcoming year? Uh, I'm, I'm talking to some people about teaching. All right. <laughs> okay. that, that's, you're going to leave it at that. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> and it'll be what will be around the election? or uh, Yeah, it would be if I did it, it would be on the 2024 elections. Yeah. You know, uh, somebody uh, that's motivated, like a, a student is motivated, wants to get involved in a Senate campaign, a presidential campaign, what – what what advice would you give them? How like how do you you know how do you take that first step? How do you get connected to get involved? Well, let, let's just say that you're a kid uh, at Lyon College in Batesville, Arkansas, and you want to get involved in a presidential campaign. What I would do is number one, I would become really knowledgeable about the campaign, so I would then I would find out where the statewide organization is. So if it's on the Republican side, who's running the presidential campaign in Arkansas? On the Democratic side, who's running the presidential campaign in Arkansas? And I would, presuming that both of those offices are in Little Rock, and they may not be, but let's presume that, I would uh, get in the car and go down and meet them. I would introduce myself. I would take my resume, and I would say, I'm not looking for a paying job. I just want to volunteer. I remember <clears throat> when the Clinton campaign, this is an interesting story. Um, the, the, <laughs> there, was a, there was a meeting, and um, someone said around the meeting, does anybody know who this person? person is and uh, and and nobody looked around. and and the guy who was running the copy machine volunteering said I, I, I don't mean to interrupt but I know that person I, I was in school with him 
it got everybody's attention. And everybody looked up and said, who are you? And he told them his name. And he said, uh, well, where were you in school with him? And he said, well, I, I got my undergraduate degree at, uh, at Stanford, and I got my law degree at the University of Chicago, and uh, we were in school together at Stanford. And the people said, what are you doing running a coffee machine? He said, I'm volunteering. I just wanted to be a part of this experience. And I'm just down here. And the guy said, well, turn off the copy machine and come sit with us at the table. Uh, and it started his career. He ate, later went to the White House. Um, <coughs> but he, he drove to Little Rock from Chicago. No job, no money, no connections, and just said, I'm volunteering. Never told somebody I was a Stanford graduate or University of Chicago graduate. That's the way you get started in politics when you don't have an immediate connection. For somebody who is like kind of nervous or kind of like unsure about entering the like political scene, what advice would you give them? As a candidate or as a as a uh, let's just go both. Let's just go both. Well, uh, number one, I think as a, uh, if you are interested in running for political office then I would try it uh, at the college level. I would run for something. on the. Co I would be involved in student government or be involved, run, it, run for leadership positions on campus. I would get involved. I would get involved in local campaigns in Batesville, even if you weren't from Batesville. Uh, I would get involved with people that, 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 are, that are involved. Uh, I, would, I would connect with the community. I... Uh, you know, I, I think it's um, I think it's real important sometimes. Uh, and and, and Lyon does a Lyon does a pretty good job. It's service days really extraordinary, and they do a lot of good things. But baseball community doesn't come out for the basketball games like it did when I was growing up there in baseball, uh, and that's because people don't know the basketball players. And if they know the basketball players. Then they're going to come out if they know if they know if they know Gavin. They're going to come out and want, want to watch him play. That's human nature. You if you if you get to, so it's really not the basketball player's fault because they're in school and they don't they can't go knock on the door and say I'm Gavin and I'm from Bryant and I'm in baseball and come watch me play. But I, I think there's got to be more connection between town and gown. Uh, and so one way to do that is 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 to get involved in political organizations and campaigns. And if I were, and, and and if you do that, you can make the decision whether you want to run for office or whether you want to be a uh, staffer, or consultant, or what other role you can have. But part of it is engaging. So I would engage in the campus level, and I would engage in the community level. And in 2024, if there's a presidential level or other campaigns, I would engage at the statewide level. I like that. I think that's a perfect way for us to wrap up, uh, Skip. Thank you so much. Thank you for having okay. me. Nice to be with you. And this is Pat Lynch. And Jason Nichols. And Gavin Brunson. And this is the Career Pathways Podcast. We'll see you next time. This broadcast is sponsored in part by Lion College and by Kilt Studios.